Yeah, like for myself, I haven't carried my wallet, like my actual wallet for the last uh, five years. So if I go out, I just need to, I just need my cell phone. Like my cell phone is, is, is my most important property. Yeah. My, my wallet, is, it, it doesn't really matter. The very first incarnation of Citibank opened in September 1812. 200 years later, they operate 2,500 branches in 160 countries and employ a little over 200,000 people for a market capitalization in the region of 200 billion US dollars. And Financial, on the other hand, has a workforce one twelfth of that, operates no branches, and has a history that goes back only as far as 2014. And yet, in the excitement of last year's later abandoned IPO, they were valued as much as 50% higher than Citi. This is How to Lend Money to Strangers, a podcast about lending strategy, and I'm your host, Brendan LaGrange. In tonight's episode, I take a closer look at the consumer credit marketplace in China with two expert guests, Dr. Zong Liu and Dr. Rui Feng Liu. Despite their shared surnames and impressive credentials, they are not related, but both men do share a similar background. Both completed their PhDs and began their credit risk careers in North America, and both have spent much of the last decade back in China, shaping the consumer credit landscape that enabled Ant's impressive growth. We talk about some of the factors that allowed the two big super apps to assume the positions of great power they hold today, and some of the complications these factors have created. We also talk about growth and regulations, and we talk a little bit about collections. And while some of what makes the Chinese market tick is unique to itself, I believe that there are plenty of lessons in there for lenders around the world, not least of all a reminder that consumers see finance only as a means to an end, and so when ownership of the underlying market shifts, so too can ownership of the financial market. We'll start with Dr. Zong Liu, who I knew as Head of Scorecard Development for a credit bureau in Asia. Zong, when I was with you in Hong Kong, which is about five years ago now, mobile wallets were busy becoming the big thing in China. And since debit cards and credit cards hadn't really made a foothold yet, there was a question about whether these would be leapfrogged, and thus whether the apps behind the mobile wallets would be the market owners and the banks would be walled out. So, as an insider, can you expand a little bit on those changes and where that balance in power currently sits? Yeah, sure. I think that's what we call channel main not here is because the mobile payment is probably you know, like one of the greatest things that ever happened in China mainland. Uh, it basically changed the people's habit. I think especially for the young people, not many people uh, that trying to get a credit card because you have the mobile uh, wallet. So uh, actually, the like the usage of the mobile wallets uh, in China mainland is like this. So you have two choices. The first choice you have is that you can have an actual like a virtual bank account. Uh, you don't need to go to the bank uh, counter to apply for a uh, card. Uh, either, uh, Debit card or credit cards, you can just use these accounts to do the uh, payments. Now, and another shares you have is that if you already got bank uh, debit cards or credit cards, you can attach those accounts to your uh, mobile wallet. So when you use your mobile wallet, actually you are using uh, your credit cards or debit cards. It's just in the format of an electronic uh, wallet. So these are the uh, two uh, usual ways that people use the mobile wallets in China mainland. Uh, and another thing is that um, because people use the uh, mobile wallet, so it creates a lot of transaction data. When I was uh, working in uh, Tencent a couple of years ago, uh, actually the uh, department I was in, uh, it has all the uh, mobile payments data uh, from the uh, Tencent uh is the WeChat uh, mobile wallet. I don't remember the exact number, but the daily transaction is about uh, 1.6 billion uh, transactions every day. So it's like a huge amount of data. And uh, what we call is the uh, monthly active users, MAU, is about 800 million people in China. So basically, like most every one in China mainland, uh, if they're 18 years old, if they're old enough to have a 
uh, bank accounts, they probably use WeChat's uh, wallet. Dr. Rifeng Liu was born and educated in China, but later moved to the US to gain his PhD, where after he entered the consumer credit industry. I went to uh, Household International at that time, which later was acquired by HSBC. So I worked there for seven years. So, so I worked in portfolio management, analytic modeling, acquisition. So all kinds of jobs. I went through the entire uh, cycle of uh, cards. I started with the prime cards. Then I worked in the near prime. Then I also worked in the subprime area. So although in one company I worked for seven years, but I had a, uh, several different jobs, worked in different portfolio. So the full spectrum of credits. Then I moved to Washington Mutual, so which was later acquired by J.P. Morgan. I stayed with J.P. Morgan for a total of eight years. So first five years in the U- in U.S., then the last three years, I was sent by J.P. Morgan to work in Beijing. This was a strategic partnership program with the China Post Seven Bank. So as you heard, Rui Feng was very much a credit card man when he was relocated to China. So I pitched him the same question about credit cards being leapfrogged, and I got very much the same answer. So for, for example, for the credit cards, China actually passed that stage didn't go through that stage. Yeah, because of when you buy stuff in Alibaba, in Tencent, they know your credit history, your, your transaction history, so they can lend you money, right? Credit card give you a convenience for purchasing. And for Alipay and for WeChat Pay, it has that convenience. So once you made the purchase and once you get the money from them, then it's a, a matter of when you pay back. So they give you a grace period for you to pay back. That's just like a credit card, right? Okay, so we're seeing leapfrogging now, but was that always the intention, do you think? When you were sent to Beijing to help the Postal Savings Bank, was the intention then to help them replicate the Western model, complete with cards, or was the idea already then to accelerate some homegrown innovations? I, I, I would think it's in the middle of what you said there. Because in China, there are four or five big banks. For example, uh, the ICBC, which is the industry and the commercial bank of China, and the Bank of China, BOC, and the CCB, China Construction Bank, and the China Agriculture Bank. So those big banks actually all get a strategic partners from the U.S. banks or Europe banks. I think the majority uh, strategic partner banks are from the U.S. So those are four big banks and the other, uh, other commercial banks, they all had strategic partnership banks. And the China Post Seven Bank was a new bank. The bank was funded in 2007. In terms of uh, managed asset, is uh, the number five big bank, and that's the only bank didn't have any strategic partnership. So because uh, the CEO of the bank and uh, J.P. Morgan senior officers, they had a personal relationship. They want to introduce. They wanted J.P. Morgan to come to help. China Post Seven Bank. So this back to what you said. So for China Post Seven Bank, it actually was a traditional seven bank. People come, people customers come here to save, uh, deposit the money. They didn't have a much direct lending business at that time. So for total for the total assets, only twenty percent of the assets was actually landed by themselves. So we were there to help them for, for example, branch management, how to operate a branch. For, for this bank, for the China Post-7 Bank, they have 
47 thousand branches how to lend the money how to do risk management there I think probably we are talking about two different things. So if we just focus on the mobile wallets, just the uh, payment uh, approach, of, it doesn't necessarily give you credit. So you still use your own money just in the format of a mobile uh, wallet. But of course, that's, uh, there are many companies in China now, uh, particularly like those, those the so-called uh, fintech companies, they provide a small loan. I think the average amount of the loan uh, is uh, within like 10,000 RMB, uh, 1,500 USD. So it's not a really huge amount compared to the credit cards or the instrument not offered by the banks. In particular for the young people, because um, they are young and they don't have a really high income and they haven't been working for a long time, it is not easy for them to get a, a credit card or a large loan from the banks. So these sort of uh, small loan products are really popular for the young people in, in, in China. And usually these loans, uh, what we call is a revolving loan, they are not an instrument loan. So it's mostly like a credit card, but the only difference is that with credit card, you have a grace period. But for this revolving loan, you don't. But it's much easier for you for, for you to use. Like it takes you literally like seconds for you to apply the, the loan online. Like you don't need to go to any banks or you don't need to produce any uh, like documents that you can get a loan like in a couple of seconds. And Zong, when these fintechs are making their loan decisions, or at least their first loan decision before they've built their own data on a customer, can they tap into this data held by Alipay, by WeChat Bank, either directly or via some sort of credit bureau? Or is that data tightly held within each universe? Oh, actually, it's a really good question. Uh, who has ownership of this data? And who can use the data? Uh, so in China, like the credit bureau business or the credit bureau industry in China is a bit different from US or Canada or even in Hong Kong. Because uh, in China, if you want to open a credit bureau, you should have the license from the central bank, the People's Bank of China. And uh, until now, there are only two of the two companies were granted uh, with such license. In originally in 2014, there are eight companies that are trying to apply for this license. And at that time, uh, the central bank said that uh, I will give you a permission for you to operate business, but I don't want to give you the license just now. You can operate for like half a year, and then I will see whether you are eligible to get the license or not. And then after six months, none of these eight companies got the license. Uh, and for uh, like the Tencent, the Alibaba, because they are huge internet companies and they have um, like hundreds, if not thousands of internet products. So of course they accumulate lots and lots of data, like both, uh, both in the uh, amount of the data and also uh, like in different dimensions of the data. But it seems that um, this data, they are sort of like the private properties of these companies. Usually they are not going to share this data with any other companies, not even with the banks. For one thing, um, they don't want to share it because like this data, of course, has a lot of value. And the second, because they don't have the credit video license, so in theory, they cannot uh, share this data with companies. So in another way, they cannot share this data for profit purpose. So uh, for the non products like offered by um, Tencent, like offered by the v- WeBank or by the Ant Group, of course, they are using data from Tencent or from Alibaba, but the reason they can use it is because like, they are the subsidy of Tencent or Alibaba, so it's okay for them to use. Yeah, but for the other banks, they can't uh, use the data directly. Probably they can use it in an indirect way. For example, uh, many of the banks, they have the so-called joint lending uh, with the uh, and group or with WeBank. So basically, the idea is that those banks have the funding but they don't have the customers, or they don't have uh, enough data uh, to do a really good credit policy. So they will uh, join with WeBank or uh, with and group, and they have this uh, joint lending. Uh, so maybe um, the bank will uh, provide like 99% of the funding, uh, and the group or WeBank only, only provide 1% of the funding, and then they will share the profits. Yeah. But uh, of course, in terms of the profit, because uh, Alibaba, they provide the customer. So they will share a big portion of uh, the profit, not uh, proportional to the capital that they provide. <laughs> yeah. So Tencent uh, does the same thing. 
and all the other in big internet companies, they all do the same thing. Yeah, so China has one centralized credit bureau. It's the PBOC, People's Bank of China. So they own that, and basically all banks are using that bureau information. All banks, and for other lending institutes, financial institutes, uh, actually people every lending institute want wants to use that, but. The PBOC Credit Bureau, they don't just give that to everybody to use. You need to apply to access to use the data, and they need to give you permission, and they need to approve that. Yeah, and for example, for the P2P companies, there were more than 6,000 P2P companies, but none of those companies were allowed to use the PBOC credit bureau information. And even for each bank, they need to apply individually to apply. And then the PBOC needs to approve. It's not automatically it will be approved. You need to first share your data for three months. You need to report your data for three months. And after they say, OK, then they will give you access to to um, uh, to to get the uh, applicants' credit bureau information, yeah. So you need to report the information first before you can get information from them. Yeah, I think that part's not too far out the ordinary. Uh, we would ask for as much as two years of retro data when taking a new lender on board at the credit bureau. But I think what's very different in China is that. The balance of power is with all these sort of innovative players that sit outside of the traditional framework in most other markets, to be honest. The bulk of the market is held by the big banks. And the big banks, you know, there's a few in number, and they've got a long tradition of fairly controlled storage of data. So it's quite easy for the, for us to say to them, this is how you're going to report data. These are special fields we're using, and this is the process. And to cover the bulk of the market in that rigid approach. And then now there's sort of coming up some fintech, some new models that might sit outside of the credit bureau until we've got a, our heads around how to incorporate them. But they're always just a few percent of the market. So actually for the industry, it's not a burning bridge. It's not a major problem. So for example, in the UK, the hot new topic is buy now, pay later. And the biggest name in that game is probably Klarna. Uh, the regulator is pushing Klarna to come on board to the credit bureau because traditionally the bulk of their business was outside of the remit um, of the financial regulator and so it wasn't reported to the credit bureau. And that's important. The industry is very keen to get that in. It does play a big role in affordability calculations or it should play a big role in affordability calculations. However, as much as they're a household name, as much as they're growing really, really fast, you know, the, the percentage share of, of credit extensions in the market is still tiny. But I see it in China the other way around that maybe it's as much as 80% of the market share on the consumer credit side is sitting outside of the banks. So it's sitting with Alipay, it's sitting with WeChat Bank. And so the pressure to to evolve the, the bureau landscape or to think of ways to incorporate them must be greatly higher. Exactly right. Like in U.S., in Canada, the banks they are the, uh, they have the power, so they are on the powerful side. But in China, it's the other way around. Because Tencent, Alibaba, they have lots of customers and they have lots of data, so actually they are more powerful. Zong, just to expand on that point, I started to talk about the younger population being especially likely to borrow from these super apps, these mobile wallets. But is that actually the case in China, or would you say this is so far rolled out now that it's the standard model for most credit active citizens today? So uh, exactly uh, like you said, like for example, for the uh, young people, like they don't have a really high income and they don't have been working for uh, a long time. They are not the targeted customers for the traditional banks, but these are the targeted customers for WeBank and uh, Alibaba because um, uh, they have some other data that the banks don't have. So they can do uh, probably better targeting or do better risk uh, measurement. So these people, they are of high risk to the banks, or at least the banks think they are high risk. But actually, 
for these two companies because they have the more data, so they can do a better job differentiate the people. They can still pick us uh, people with uh, good uh, quality, and they can do the uh, lending. But for the more senior people or the people with high income, uh, like for example, for myself, sometimes I do uh, lending from the V Bank or and Group, but it's uh, really, really seldom. It's really, really occasionally. Uh, most of the time, I still do the lending from the uh, banks because for the traditional banks, if they offer you a loan, usually the price is lower than the price can be offered by a uh, V-Bank. Because remember, like I said, the majority of the funding for these companies, for these two companies, is still coming from the banks. So their price, in theory, they can be lower than the banks. It's not because they can offer you a lower price or more uh, lower amounts. Uh, the, I think the advantage is that it is um, much easier for you to use. It's really efficient. And also, uh, their standard is a little bit lower than the traditional banks. Especially for those young people, like they, they don't care to apply for a credit card from the banks. It's not only that the banks um, wouldn't give the card to them because they are too young, they don't have enough income or things like that. They just don't want to go through the more tedious or more painful process to get a credit card. I think now the situation it may change a little bit, but still, like lots of the young people, they don't want to go through that process. And once I, when I worked internationally before, like we did some uh, like customer uh, survey, like we asked them because for the for the revolving loan, there's no grace period. Now once you use it, you have to pay for the insurance. We did a customer uh, survey. We asked the customers like, why you want to pay for the insurance, right? So like for the credit card, at least you have the grace period. And lots of the people, uh, particularly for the young people, uh, they are surprised that they don't care about the insurance. But the thing that is the amount is the no amount is really small. So in an absolute sense, uh, the interest you pay is it's not too much. So yeah. for the young people, like the, I, I don't I don't really care. Like if I need to pay a small amount to change for the convenience, they think it is uh, it's not a bad choice. So it really depends on uh, what you want. Um, but of course, it leads to another problem. And now the regulation agency in China they have noticed that. So. Uh, in their view, that this sort of joint lending it may cause some problems because for uh, Tencent or for Alibaba, they are not banks. They don't have capital requirements, but actually they control the customers and they control the data and they basically do the risk management. So if something wrong with Tencent and Alibaba, then uh, this sort of risk will be passed to the banks for sure because the majority, like 99% of the funding is still from the banks. Like, like no one would expect this in uh, five years ago. Like when it starts, people people don't think that it can grow so fast and grow so huge in such a short time. So that does change the market and does change the, uh, the whole environment. Like for example, for Ant Group, uh, as far as I know, assets they have for now, it should be more than one trillion dollars. That's why the regulation agencies, they are so concerned. Because in China, for lending business, you must have a license. As you know, for a bank, you have a capital requirement, right? About the two, about the three requirement. You can only lend so much. And also, you have a consumer lending license. That also has uh, some kind of uh, restrictions on the amount you can lend. And another thing is a micro uh, lending company that also has uh, some kind of restrictions. So for all those kind of ways to generate lending money at most by the regulation is you can only lend about five times of the registered rated capital. Speaking of risk weighted capital, let's talk about risk. What is risk like in the consumer credit market in China with the advent of these fintech powerhouses who also have interests in other parts of the business? Have you seen risk rise or sort of, I guess, a bit more generally, just what is the state of risk uh, in lending in China today? I mean, for the um, risk management, it's a bit of difference. And the difference is not about the technique you use or the data you use. I think it's uh, more about the, risk, the, the the logic of the risk measurement. Because in the traditional banks, risk measurement is more about how you can develop a better model, how you can develop a better credit policy, like using 
probably more data are uh, used uh, more advanced uh, modeling techniques. But uh, for the internet lending, uh, you should combine the risk management with the product uh, for two uh, different companies. Like the model is more or less the same. The data you are using is more or less the same. But the deferral rates is quite different, uh, simply because like more one product like, it can offer better customer experience than the other one. And because if there are two products, uh, internet, uh, many products uh, you can choose, and one they have a really good customer experience, and the other one the customer experience is really bad. Uh, and it is, it is quite significant uh, when it comes to the internet uh, lending. And also they can control the customer's behavior because the platform itself, because if, for example, the, a customer borrowed money from this platform, and if at the end the customer doesn't pay, then Alibaba can close the account because everybody uses Alibaba or uh, Taobao. That's, uh, that, that, that's something that you, not, you cannot avoid. Yeah, because the reason I realize this problem is that, um, like for my current employer, like we also provide some uh, lending product to our customers. And uh, from time to time, like I would like to talk to the customers on the phone, especially talk to those um, in delinquency. When our college team calls them, sometimes uh, like I'll, I'll ask them questions and that thing. So one, I ask the several people the same question, like, when you borrow the money from us, like what is the usage of your money? Like you use it for like buying something or just the, for like uh, traveling or things like that. And for the delinquent people, a really high percentage is about the 15% of the people, uh, they borrow the money from us and pay off their debts uh, to the V Bank or to the uh, Alibaba. Because uh, like to them, it's like you said, it's like a hierarchy thing. Tencent, Alibaba, like they are so dominant in their life. Like they, they don't want to break their good relationship with those companies. But for us, like we are small companies, they don't really care about us. So they have no problem borrow all money to pay off their debts with them. <laughs> so, so, so naturally, it is very really hard for you to get uh, to for you to get uh, as low delinquency rates uh, as those uh, companies. It's not that you don't have a better model or you don't have a better credit policy. It is just that the uh, the willingness of your customer to pay back to you uh, is smaller than uh, they have paid to those uh, big uh, companies. Yeah, that's interesting because normally sort of part and parcel of being a micro lender is knowing you're bottom of the pile uh, when it comes to the hierarchy of repayments. But Alipay and, and WeChat Pay, because they're part of these organizations that touch every part of Chinese life, they flip that around and, and suddenly, even though it's a small debt, it's gained itself top billing in the, the consumer's mind. And another thing that I want to say is that it's also the same problem that my friends at the banks, they're really concerned of. The banks have this um, business partnership with uh, Alibaba and Tencent. So that is, the, all the customers, they, they don't know the banks behind those uh, lending products because they're just the, uh, the funding providers. But what they see is the brands of Tencent. So in theory, the, the customers, uh, they are um, like the clearly known from the banks. And uh, the banks have all the customers' information, but actually, like the, the banks are invisible to the customers. Uh, like starting when you are like a young students, uh, you have the student loan, and then you uh, graduate, so you have your uh, your first job, you got your credit cards, and then you can have your instrument loan. And when you get married, you need to buy a house, then you need to have a, a mortgage. Because in different stage of your life, you have different needs for the uh, lending products, uh, for some products from the banks. So the customer actually is uh, the, the most valuable asset for the banks. But for most of the banks now, if they have this, when they have this partnership with Tencent or Alibaba, actually they don't have the customer. So this is the biggest problem for them. And now just a, a bit of a change in direction, I guess, but... Rui Feng, I'm not sure if you've done a lot of work in collections, but I'd be quite interested to know how that side of risk works. Once consumers do go delinquent or are starting to get into financial trouble, what is the normal approach to collecting these debts? Yeah. So I would say depends on who the lender is. For banks, for example, the delinquency rate is very, very low. And especially in the last few years, 40 years ago, the delinquency rate for all the Chinese banks are very, very high. 
the bad rate, 90 plus days delinquency rate is over 40 percent. That's 40 years ago. But uh, later, the delinquency rate for banks are very low. The reason is because uh, there are lots of new lenders came out, as I said, micro lending companies and P2P companies. So if a, if a consumer has a difficulty to pay a bank, then they will borrow money from a micro lending company to pay the banks. And if they could not get it from a micro lending company, they could borrow from a P2P company to pay. And for China, for example, for credit card, if you charge a credit card and you don't pay back, it's not a credit issue. It's a crime issue. So you, you, you could be put in jail. So that makes the bank's delinquency rate very, very low in the past years. But it went up, I believe, in the last one year because all the P2P companies are gone. The Chinese government doesn't want these P2P companies to exist anymore. So they are all gone. So now that means they don't have any new source to borrow, to pay the banks. So that naturally put the banks delinquency rate high. And in terms of collection, before well, the Chinese mindset is if you borrow money, then you have to pay back. There is no bankruptcy, personal bankruptcy. Even if you cannot pay back, your son, your daughter will pay for you. That's the history of the mindset in the Chinese. But now this changed also quite a lot, especially started from two years ago in China. So before, for example, you can go to the borrower's home, but get into the house or the home to ask them to pay. Now you cannot do that. If the borrower doesn't give you permission to enter the home, it's against the law. Uh, if you do collection through phone calls, only make a phone calls at a certain time. And the number of calls for one day is only three. And you cannot make a connection phone calls to the relatives two years ago, three years ago. When I make the credit decision, lending decision to the person, I will collect it. Or the phone company of numbers of the relatives, the friends, and the local numbers, then I can make phone calls to anybody that forced the person to pay. But now this situation changed. You can make only three calls, collection calls a day, and you cannot go to the person's home. But for, for banks, they can still make a file a lawsuit to the person that who doesn't pay. Right. And this is protected by the law. And also, actually, the, the credit uh, sense is uh, stronger, than, uh, stronger than before. So people all care about the credit history. Yeah, so if they don't make a payment, especially for a small amount, and they put a, a record in the credit history, it's not worth it. So people all have that kind of sense. Of course, if the, the amount is too huge, it's worth to not pay, then it's different. Rifeng, right, right in the introduction, you talked about your experience working in the different risk rates of the credit cards, you know, working subprime through to superprime. And obviously, the States probably leads the way in terms of consumer awareness of the detail of their credit scores, where you know, quite a lot of consumers will even know that whether they're superprime, even know kind of the score cutoff they're aiming for. But certainly, it's probably safe to say the majority of people know about the concepts of prime, superprime, subprime. And will be familiar with their own credit score and where they sit on that spectrum. When you talk about this growing awareness of the credit profiles in China, does that extend to that same depth that people are striving to be super prime and looking for help and looking for strategies to manage their credit upwards? Or is it still a little bit more rudimentary where people are mainly just trying to avoid a black mark on their record? Actually, the PBOC Credit Bureau, they built a school, but that school was never populated. So for general 
customers, they don't know such a score exists. They just know that I have delinquency history or not. But there is a similar score. It's built by Alibaba. But Alibaba score is only a internal score for Alibaba. To the doctors, Liu, thank you very much for making the time to appear on the show today. Uh, China, I think, is a market that all of us in the West look at, and you know the scale of it can can leave us somewhat in awe. But also, we sometimes feel like we might be missing the nuances. And it's interesting to hear that, yeah, there are these names that don't exist in in the Western lending. There are these models where the power is shifted, but actually, a lot of what's happening is very familiar to us. And I think, as I said in my introduction, there's actually a lot of lessons. It might be different times、uh, it emerge in a different order. But some of this interplay between what a consumer wants to do with their money and where they get that money is something that all lenders need to bear in mind as they look at the future and the trends they're seeing. So thank you again、uh, for making that time and for joining me. And for those of you listening, thank you for joining the show. This has been How to Lend Money to Strangers, the podcast about lending strategies across the credit life cycle and around the world. Today we were talking about China, a country with one billion people. Next week we're shrinking it all the way down, and we're going to find a little country called Georgia, in between Eastern Europe and Western Asia, with a population of just four million. I'm speaking to Joffrey Turin, a scorecard builder and consultant based there, about lending in Georgia and about building scorecards from microfinance. Please do join me next Thursday for that. But things changed quite a lot、uh, in the last ten years. But basically, before they don't have、uh, the technology, they don't have that, that much of models to judge the risk, and therefore credit sense is not there. But in the last ten years, things changed a lot, and therefore the the big banks they actually.、Uh, Shifted a lot from enterprise lending to consumer lending.